So every once in a while, you come across what we call a paradigm shift. And this happened to me about four years ago. I had a patient, an ideal patient for fecal transplant, because her daughter was a nurse, and her son-in-law was an infectious disease physician. And she had C. diff colitis for about seven months. This took a healthy 85-year-old with no medical problems to a nursing home with a rectal tube, with a nasogastric tube for feeding. She'd lost about 30 pounds of weight and essentially debilitated her. We tried every treatment that was available for C. diff from top to bottom, and the infection would go away. But when we stopped the medications, it would come back. And whenever we have a difficult patient, I did what most of us do. We Google. And up popped many reports about this new treatment for recurrent C. diff colitis. And after talking it over, we decided to do it. The patient's son-in-law was the donor. I did the transplant on a Friday. And remember, this was a patient who had diarrhea every day for almost seven months and had a rectal tube in place. She went home. I tried not to call her on Saturday morning or on Sunday morning. I said, there's a physician in the family. They're going to call me back if there is a problem. And Monday, when I first thing I did when I got to the clinic, I called them. I said, there's a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the patient is now constipated. The patient had, had no bowel movements for the last 72 hours. And that's when something clicked. I said, this is a change. It's a paradigm shift. What we thought of good is actually, what we thought of as being bad is actually good. And stool is actually the best probiotic we have. So since then, at Borland Brewer Clinic, we have done 40 plus fecal transplants. Todd is the other person who does it with me. And we have a 100% <coughs> track record. So I'm going to give you a brief overview and then take questions. So fecal transplant is basically the transmission of stool from a healthy donor to a patient. It's not new. It was described 1,600 years ago in China. And then it was used extensively in the 16th century for gastroenteritis. And note that the first report was in 1958 for pseudomembranous colitis we didn't know this was caused by Clostridium difficile then. And the single enema resulted in cure uh, in this patient. And the first published data for C. diff colitis was in 1983. So it's been around for a long time. And that's why my first slide said that the voyage of discovery is basically just looking at things in a different way. But why are we so interested in fecal transplant? It's because those of us who practice in hospitals know that we are in the midst of an epidemic, an epidemic of really frightening proportions. The number of C. diff colitis patients has increased from 98,000 to 178,000, almost double in this study. Hospital discharges for C. diff have doubled. The case fatality rate has doubled. We're seeing about somewhere between 500 to 3 million cases annually. And the excess cost is $3.2 billion. But the disease has also changed. There is a strain of C. diff called the NAP1B1027 strain, originally described in Montreal, which has spread in an epidemic proportion. And this is the C. diff that leads to colectomy, to ICU admissions, and hospital deaths. It's a hypervirulent strain, and its main characteristic is that it is resistant to fluoroquinolones. And one dose of Levaquin will select this bacteria out. And it produces a toxin that is very strong and in enormous uh, quantity. And this is the C. diff that I think a fecal transplant might be able to address. So what is the current treatment? Most of you are familiar with the current treatment of C. diff. We start with metronidazole and or vancomycin for certain uh, selected patients. 
But the problem with current treatment is that after the first attack, about 15 to 35 patients will have a recurrent attack. After the second attack, about 45%. And after the third attack, 65% will have a recurrence. And nobody knows what to do with these recurrent patients. Most of the data is anecdotal. Fidoxamycin, for example, has a 12% reduction in the rate of recurrent C. diff colitis and can be used. Vancomycin over a prolonged period can be used. There are regimens describing pulsed and tapered vancomycin followed by other antibiotics. Combination regimens have been described. And as you can see, the pharmaceutical industry is very interested in uh, treatments for C. diff colitis, uh, including all these medications that have been tried. The bottom line is none of them work effectively for recurrent C. diff colitis. And why? Now we got to take a step back and see why don't these medications work? They get rid of the C. diff, but something has happened to these patients that makes the antibiotic ineffective uh, in the recurrent phase. So as you know, the human um, biome project uh, has just been completed, the initial phase, and the data from the human biome project are amazing. Um, they're eye-opening. So in the bacteria, in the gut of mammals, we have about 50 bacterial phyla. And they're difficult to culture. We were not aware of them because the vast majority, more than 90%, cannot be cultured. And culture used to be the gold standard for identifying bacteria. But using RFLB, uh, I'm sorry, terminal RFLP fractions and gene sequencing, we've been able to identify these bacteria. It turns out in the human gut, more than 90% of the bacteria belong to these two phyla. Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes. And there are 10 times more bacterial cells in the human gut than human cells. I find this to be an amazing statistic. We may just be carriers for these bacteria. And there, there are bacteria in the gut, as John had mentioned, H. pylori. There's bacteria in the small bowel. And the proportion of bacteria increases. And when you reach the terminal ileum, that's when you see the enormous increase in the number of bacteria. So the reason why patients with C. diff colitis get a recurrence is because their normal colonic biome has been disrupted. There are multiple studies now showing that the, both the variety and the amount of good bacteria are low. So there is a decreased amount of bacteroidetes and firmicutes and increased proteobacteria and acinetobacteria phyla. There is also some evidence that the way the bacteria handle the bile acids leads to almost undetectable secondary bile acids in the gut, in the colon, and that leads to a, a proliferation of the commensal bacteria. And there are new treatments based on this observation that I may touch upon later. So what a fecal transplant does is it restores this term we're using now called colonization resistance. In other words, this large number of bacteria in our gut actually protect us, not just from C. diff, but from many other diseases and infections. And by replacing the healthy uh, biome, um, we give back colonization resistance. There is now data that the new biome persists up to four months, some people believe forever. So who should get a fecal transplant? The first two are the currently accepted indications for fecal transplant. If you have a patient with recurrent C. diff colitis, that is a total of three attacks, or if you have a patient with two attacks, but they are severe enough to land the patient in the hospital. If you do a fecal transplant for these indications or refer patients for these indications, uh, these are approved by the FDA and th these are based on consensus guidelines. Once in a while, we do them for patients with one episode of C. diff colitis, but it's fulminant. There are now dozens of studies, hundreds even, 
looking at fecal transplantation for different diseases, including refractory ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diarrhea predominant IBS, severe refractory constipation, and this is very interesting in fatty liver. As you know, with the obesity epidemic, we're seeing an epidemic of fatty liver and no treatment works. And the two most exciting treatments for fatty liver are coffee, so I hope you had some this morning, and fecal transplant. Interestingly, there are now phase two studies on fecal transplant in all these diseases. Parkinson's disease, <coughs> chronic fatigue syndrome, autism, and most interestingly, obesity. It turns out that after a gastric bypass, not only do you not absorb nutrients, but in some way it changes your colonic biome. Uh, there is some data that close to 25% of the weight loss after a gastric bypass is due to alteration in your biome. I have an interest in obesity and I talk to my patients about it and patients want to do this. Unfortunately, um, you cannot do them out of a study setting currently. So to do a fecal transplant, you need a donor. And who should the donor be? I tell all my patients, the donor should be the healthiest, cleanest living, youngest person that you know. And it doesn't have to be somebody related to you, even though patients find that a little more appealing. At Borland Gruber Clinic, we use a standard blood bank screening questionnaire for our donors. Essentially, they can't have any high risk activity for three months uh, so that they don't have any subtle infections. They shouldn't have any significant comorbidity. There are no absolute contraindications, but if they have metabolic syndrome, we try to dissuade them from being donors. If they have uncontrolled diabetes, they're morbidly obese, um, but there are no absolute contraindication except for infections. So how do we check them? We do blood tests to rule out hepatitis A, B, C, HIV, and syphilis, and we do stool studies for different bacteria. So how do you do a fecal transplant? There are three ways of doing a fecal transplant. You can do it through an upper endoscopy or through a nasoduodenal tube. You can do it through an enema, or you can do it through colonoscopy. The data suggests that all these three methods are equally effective. There is some evidence that colonoscopy has a slightly more, um, uh, has a higher uh, response rate. There is data, and I have some personal um, uh, uh, preference, that patients like colonoscopy the best. Most patients tell me, put me to sleep and you can do whatever you want. And since colonoscopy, most of these patients are elderly, they've had screening colonoscopies, they've had a good experience, the colonoscopy gets the highest acceptance rate. I think Todd has done uh, some through the upper tract and he's got very good results. So they all work. And I offer all three methods to my patients. And the procedure is very simple. The patient collects stool and Tupperware, drops it up at Borland Gruber Clinic. The patient comes and is processed like a routine colonoscopy. We get one additional consent. We give them four milligrams of Imodium before the procedure. I do the colonoscopy, reach the cecum, and do the transplant. That's it. It's very low tech. Patients go home. The ideal amount of stool is still under debate, but it may be as little as 100 grams. That is half a small cup. And I do 300 grams, more is better in my opinion. So patients go home, and I've told you my first case, and that's been pretty much the experience with all my other patients. And the most common question I get is, are there any side effects to fecal transplant? There have now been almost 2,000 published cases of fecal transplant, and there have been no major side effects. One patient who had ulcerative colitis and C. diff had a flare of the colitis. Four patients developed some kind of autoimmune disease, but it was felt not to be related to the transplant. There was one report of aspiration after colonoscopy and one colonic perforation. None of them really related to the transplant. 
when was the last time you did a treatment of any kind and there were no major side effects? There is a recent large published data on immunocompromised patients, patients with uh, um, um, difficult cancers who are undergoing chemotherapy, and they got a very high response rate without any major infectious complications. So does fecal transplant work? The, a met, recent meta-analysis of all the published data shows that it works nine out of 10 times, 92% effective rate. At borland Grover Clinic, we have a 100% uh, cure rate for uh, recurrent C. diff colitis. And the diarrhea resolves in an average about three days. And the cure, this is important, lasts months, maybe years. We have had patients who've gone back on chemotherapy. We have patients with recurrent urinary tract infection or osteomyelitis who've been able to go back on antibiotics without any recurrence. As I've mentioned, the efficacy is similar for all three methods. And the, the last point is very important. What is patient acceptance of fecal transplant? Do they like it? Are they going to come back? 97% of patients who underwent FMT for recurrent C. diff would do it again. 53% would prefer it as their first line of treatment before metronidazole or vancomycin. And 77% would pay out of, for it out of their own pocket. When I used to do this, when I, when I sit down with my patients, I reserve about 10, 15 minutes to talk to them about it. And they, don't, they say, where is the consent? I've never had to convince a patient uh, to have fecal transplant. Somehow, patients intuitively get it that this is very natural and don't require any convincing. It's the, it's the referring physicians and colleagues who need a lot of convincing and data uh, to have this done. As Kyle had mentioned, at Borland Gruber Clinic, uh, we were part of a large uh, multi-center research study using a fecal product uh, called RBX2660, made by a company called Rebiotics. Basically, it's filtered, screened stool, which comes in a pre-prepared enema. And the initial reports were first published at the ACG meeting this October uh, in Philadelphia, and we got an 87% response rates with no significant side effects. Uh, the phase 2B study is starting next week, so if you have any patients with recurrent C. diff colitis, we would love to enroll them in the study. Uh, this may be the first FMT product that may reach the market maybe in about a year or so. What's the future? Um, there is a bank, similar to a blood bank. There is now a stool bank in Boston, uh, started by a young MIT PhD uh, researcher. And they take healthy donors, they screen them every six weeks, and they use their stool, they freeze them, and they ship them to you for $250. And there are some concerns about um, whether the FDA approves this method or not, but this saves a lot of donor uh, screening and costs, and their screening is very, very extensive. And they track every batch, and they keep a sample on store for three years. So it's, it's amazing, and it's all done in a nonprofit method. I haven't used it, but I have registered with Open Biome, and I may use them for my next uh, few patients. In November of this year, there was a paper published in JAMA about taking stool, processing it, freeze drying it, and putting it in capsules. And they gave 15 or 20 capsules day one and day two, and they got, I think, upwards of 90% response rates. There are now several phase two studies using designer uh, bacteria. So only three to 33 species of bacteria have been cultured. They've been again been frozen, freeze dried, and put in a capsule. And they're getting response rates of about 85%. And in the future, this may be how we treat not just C. diff, but many other gastrointestinal disease diseases with uh, designer uh, bacteria. There are some studies using uh, secondary bile acids, uh, 
uh, which help the proliferation of the good bacteria in the gut. So this is an exciting field. It's not just exciting in GI. Last week, I read, a st I read an article in the New York Times where an ENT surgeon had recurrent sinusitis, and uh, what he did was he took um, a swab and put it into his son's nose and swabbed it in his nose. And his recurrent sinusitis was improved. There are now anecdotal reports of people with skin conditions, eczema, um, who responded to um, um, rubbing your skin against a healthy person. Um, so this is a very exciting field. It's, um, it's not just, I think we're finally learning the role of bacteria in health and in disease. And I think it's a very, very exciting field to be in. Questions? Yes, sir. Okay, so the data is that you get your bacteria from your mom. So the first inoculum is when the babies are, when, when babies are born, it, there are studies showing that the entire colonic bacteria of a newborn resembles the vaginal flora of a mom. You've seen data that nat vaginal delivery may be better for many diseases uh, compared to cesarean section, that may be based. And then mother's milk has certain compounds which allow a proliferation of her species of bacteria and not any, any other. And that's how you get your first inoculum in the first six months. It's almost a mirror image. And then over a period of time, you get your own subspecies, depending on who you played with, where you played, how many antibiotic courses you got. And that's what leads to your healthy bacteria. And of course, when it gets disrupted, it's tough to sometimes bring it back. Yes, Todd. I have to ask you a slightly different topic, but again about probiotics and the role in general, and should they be put in yogurt? Will that give you or just have yogurt? Talk about the whole fad of probiotics. Thank you. Great question, Todd. So, in my opinion, probiotics are the most oversold product in the world. There is a small amount of data that certain one or two species of probiotics help IBS, Bifidobacterium infantis. VSL number three helps patients with pouchitis. A few species may help shorten the duration of diarrhea. That's it. There is no evidence for any benefit to any other probiotic. So Activia is sold as a treatment for constipation. There was a very small study which showed that a, uh, they had a, like a six or eight percent improvement in bowel frequency when they used it for two weeks. I think probiotics are old hat. We're now moving into prebiotics and biotics. So um, I think probiotics, what we call probiotics are not very useful um, in treatment of disease. Uh, so that's my personal opinion. What is the difference between pre and post and probiotics? So probiotics are bacteria that have been cultured in yogurt or in capsules, and you take them. Prebiotics are food products that promote the growth of bacteria. The hottest thing is kimchi. I don't know if there are any people from Korea here, but kimchi is a great prebiotic as are fermented foods, pickles, fiber. What we used to call fiber, and fiber is a very old term, fiber laxative. The correct term is phytonutrient. It turns out that the most important role of fiber is to promote certain species of healthy bacteria. And so fiber is, would be considered a prebiotic, something that would promote the growth of healthy bacteria in your gut. So, Does the donor have to be like histocompatible when we do the testing? No, uh, we don't even check their um, AB uh, compatibility. Um, that's a very interesting question, but we don't check for that at all. In fact, the donor doesn't, 
In fact, it's probably better if the donor is not related to you and they don't live with you. Um, so I think the bacteria are unique. In other words, they live in a very unique closed environment where they're not exposed to blood or to Im the immune system. Maybe that's why. But we don't do the screening. Oh, yes. Yeah, there, there are, um, I think, uh, there were first several anecdotal reports. As you know, autism, autism is a difficult disease to treat, and nobody knows what causes it. And there were, I, I saw at least two papers on fecal transplant and autism where they showed improvement in, in certain measurable criteria. And I believe there are certain phase two studies going on. I don't know the exact... I'm not sure where. I can look it up and email that to you. Sure. Sure. Yes? Yeah, a few years back, they were implicating TPI for severe ACGs. Have they really followed that up? Um, at the last ACG meeting, which I went to, the consensus was that TPIs do increase the risk of getting uh, C. diff based on the fact that they reduce the number of healthy bacteria uh, uh, because of the low acidity. It's not a significant risk. But if I have a patient with a recurrent C. diff, I stop their PPI and switch them to Pepsid, H2 blocker, or something, if they can. I have one question. Yes. The 8% of people in whom it did not work, you said 92% were success. What was, the, what was the reason in those 8%? Were there any specific reasons why the transplant didn't work? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, when I say 92% response rate, some of them required a second treatment. Um, and I haven't looked into the reason for failure, um, and maybe I should, uh, but I don't know the answer to that question. Yes, Why Mama. Why not uh, use high enema transplant, which will uh, uh, not need PGD or colonoscopy, and if that fails, you can always go for the second high enema, and probably the third time should be the interventional or rather Sure. So I'll address your second point first. So remember, the flora in the, in the recipient is defective. So their family members probably share the defective flora. Th there is no data. To, in fact, it actually doesn't matter. We're talking about 87% versus 90% effective rate. Uh, patient acceptance is definitely higher for somebody known to you. It is my personal bias that it should not be somebody who lives with you. It can be a family member. If it's your son, it's better if they don't live with you. Um, and there are reasons for that. So uh, your first question was about uh, enemas. The studies show that you have to give repeated enemas, either three to five. And it is actually the least um, expensive treatment, and it works but it requires a lot of effort on the patient's part to collect the stool, to process it, put an enema bag and take it. I find most patients and their family members are not willing to do it. Um, we like high-tech medicine. We like scope, sedation, transplants when they're sedated. But you're right, if you have a patient, you don't need to send them to a gastroenterologist. Get the consent, do it, and ask them to make the enema and take it, but they have to be more than one. Colonoscopy and upper endoscopy is a single event donor uh, stool. For enemas, you have to do them repeatedly. And I think you have patients' uh, acceptance because lay people are definitely influenced by uh, news media, <coughs> and everyone is using it, and that's why they know before they come to you about the. Uh, Correct. The that is, I agree, actually. Do you have time for more questions? One more question. Dan. Okay. 
The don that's a very good question. Donor testing is very expensive. It runs between twelve to eighteen hundred dollars, depending on your insurance. I just bill the donor's insurance, and so far we haven't had a rejection. There was one patient recently who refused to be the donor when they found out the cost, but that's a genuine concern. The donor's insurance should be willing to pay for it. I don't know the mechanism. I just do it, and so far we haven't had any issues. We, no, we don't use, we use regular healthy adult uh, uh, diagnosis for donor. And so far, I think it's under the radar for most insurance companies. That's why we haven't had any issues, so. High deductible, High deductible that's a big issue, and I don't know the solution to that. Again, Thank you, everybody.